So, um, the Winter's Tale is an odd one. It's a difficult play to understand or account for, really. And it's certainly a difficult play to market. I don't know what this mug says from quoting the Winter's Tale, but the problem with the Winter's Tale is, um, you know, who can tell me a famous quote from it? The only things we've got here are these. Famous quotations from the Winter's Tale are just exit pursued by a bear, which we'll look at later. And um, I was surprised to find this one, go rot, because who knew we young Delahoy children all those years ago were quoting Shakespeare at each other. Um, this play, if you're interested in the Aristotelian unities, does not have them. It defies them, actually, and that seems to have bugged Ben Johnson. And talk about deus ex machina, that artificial way of ending plays or um, literary works. Um, the obvious example is when you take a creative writing class and you have to read somebody else's work of 11 pages long and at the end that person writes, and then I woke up, which makes you so happy that you wasted 11 pages of um, engaging in meaninglessness. Well, deus ex machina literally means God out of a machine, so originally this would have been somewhat literal where because of um, impossible to resolve plot matters, uh, God would come down, Athena or somebody, and say, okay, you're not dead, um, you have vengeance against him, um, this is, you have memory loss, and it's all, it's all cleared up. Um, so those artificial endings um, are a problem, and the critics have said about this play, this play has not only gods out of a machine, but a bear and a storm and a yacht from a machine, too. Um, it's baffling. Uh, in literary history, John Dryden in the late 1600s included this play among a few others and said it's a ridiculous incoherent story, it's grounded on impossibilities, or at least it's so meanly written that the comedy neither causes your mirth nor the serious part your concernment. Alexander Pope, early 1700s, is convinced that very little of this play was by Shakespeare, only maybe some characters and scenes, because it's so peculiar. And the play, as you know, is cast into um, the label Romance. Originally, in the first folio, this play and the others, others of its ilk were considered comedies, but that's only because the endings aren't tragedies, really. But these aren't comedies that are very funny at all, and the endings aren't really all that joyous entirely either. So maybe all of Shakespeare's problem plays, but certainly all these so-called romances are problem plays. Lytton Strachey decided that these romances were written by a bored, cynical old man. But worse than that, as for Shakespeare's motivation for writing this play, um, here is a fairly weak attempt uh, to account for it. So if you go with the traditional orthodox Shakespeare as green merchant playwright story, then you can say, like Leontes, the play's author had also lost a son and married off a daughter. Astounding. <laughs> Eerie. Yet there is no specific reason to read the play. Now, this is Marjorie Garber from Harvard, the Shakespearean there. Yet there is no specific reason to read the play as in any way autobiographical, except in the sense that all artistic work is part of the autobiography of its creator. It seems to me a pretty ambivalent, if not self-contradictory, statement. So while it's not surprising that the Stratfordians um, have a hard time with this one. Oxfordians have done little better. Um, it's kind of a matter of fragments and scraps when we think about this. But there's one triumph, certainly, in place. In a generic way, what we're told about this play, and especially about its title and the notion there, is that although Winter's Tales are supposed to be like old wives' tales, like Stanley Wells wants to say, and certainly the implausibilities in what Shakespeare does here present a kind of an old-fashioned tale. That's always noted, too. The title otherwise ha makes no sense for this play, A Winter's Tale. The story takes place over a span of 16 years, and the ballast, the center of the play, what mostly takes place in uh, springtime at a festival, so not winter. And if the wintery iciness is supposed to characterize Leontes' heart, well, that's thawed by the time most of the play takes place, and in any case, that's remote from most of that action anyway. Oxfordians, 
Fortunately, those who are convinced that Edward de Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford, is the actual author using the pseudonym Shakespeare, have put forth an explanation for this title, and certainly it's got to be <clears throat> useful. Um, this is discovered by Richard Desper. In French, the Winter's Tale would be rendered Comte d'Hiver, and I know, well, so what? Um, why are we going there anyway? But rather than um, the histoire, it's the history of winter, it's the account of winter, the winter's tale, and that is sounding like the Count de Vere, especially in Elizabethan pronunciation. Um, yeah, but so what? Because it's not the Earl de Vere. Well, actually, yes. It is Count de Vere, Earl de Vere. On the continent, they retained Count and Countesses, so you'd be introduced as the Count and Countess Dracula. Um, in England, they retained the um, Anglo-Saxon title Earl, so you'd be introduced as the Earl and Countess of Oxford. So if that seems like um, a disturbingly Baconian sleight of hand there, remember that Shakespeare is um, perfectly happy to give you an entire scene in the middle of Henry V um, with French-English wordplay um, seems designed solely to um, bring forth two lewd puns. And what are the groundlings doing with a scene like that? So if this is happening, the Earl de Vere is why we have the title The Winter's Tale, we've got a case here of another seemingly desperate embedding of the name. And Shakespeare is always right. This is a problem. The critics for a while will say, oh, Shakespeare, you never went to Italy, and you don't know anything about geography and waterways, because you can't catch a ship from an inland city in northern Italy. And then it's realized, oh, well, in Shakespeare's time, you used canals, and yes, you could use ships. But then Shakespeare's always right, except for one time when he says that his name will be buried and he will be forgotten. What an idiot, because everybody knows the name Shakespeare, unless he means his real name, unless he is so desperate um, about the um, coming anonymity that he is taking these extreme turns to um, give inappropriate names to plays and in embed himself elsewhere. Okay, so what about topical matters that would shed some light? We will get to the play itself, and then we'll coast on through it. But um, in terms of um, contextualizing this, what have we got? Some of the better Oxfordians of old have made some connections to Sir Walter Raleigh's colonizing and his rise in court. Um, but that seems pretty much a matter of scraps. The two places that we are at in this play, Sicily and Bohemia, have been um, proposed as Sicilianum, that is Lord Burley, William Cecil, who has so much power in England and essentially rules the court and possibly Elizabeth too, um, bitterly might lead to you referring to England as the land of, of Cecil. Um, and there has been speculation about the notion of the colonial aspect of all of this, too. Um, if the Virginia colony, as we're advised to allegorically read Perdita as, uh, this becomes more of an abstraction, much less convincing as a human tale of emotions or anything relevant at all, I think. It might be a layer in there, but so too, similarly, you can make some connections to the trial of Mary Queen of Scots, if you like, with the trial of Hermione before the monarch too. But these sort of scattered allusions don't really seem to go anywhere and don't really make the play gel sufficiently. So let's instead enter into this winter's tale and um, go through and see where we might be led both by the atmosphere and the events of the play. After initial scene in Act 1 where a few lords exchange completely over-the-top courtesies, and perhaps that demonstrates how exaggerated matters can wander from the truth in the royal court, um, we have the king of Sicily, Leontes, and his wife Hermione trying to persuade Leontes' old friend Polixenes, who's the king of Bohemia, to extend his visit. 
Polixenes says, Nine changes of the watery star hath been the shepherd's note since we have left our throne without a burden. I multiply with one, we thank you, many thousands more. I am questioned by my fears of what may chance or breed upon our absence. So he's still insisting that, you know, it's been lovely, but he's got to go. Um, once we find out that Hermione is pregnant, and once Leontes very soon is going to flip out with suspiciousness, um, you may notice, um, in retrospect, some ostensibly innocent references to the matter of nine months, burden, multiply, breed, and some of the language here, and you end up wondering if some of that works subliminally on Leontes. Leontes thanks Hermione for the success of her eloquence in getting Polixenes to stay on, and he says that only once before has he known her to speak so well and so eloquently, and she insists that he reveal to her what was that previous occasion. And he says, why, that was when three crabbed months had soured themselves to death, ere I could make thee open thy white hand, and clap thyself, my love, then didst thou utter, I am yours forever. So this is pretty dark wording for um, a memory of becoming engaged. Beneath the veneer of all the extreme courtesy that's going on and nobody acknowledging what they're really thinking, I guess, Leontes is completely possessed very quickly with a self-consuming, fanatical state of mind. Um, and noting to himself when uh, his wife is being friendly with Polixenes, to be paddling palms and pinching fingers as they are now and making practiced smiles as in a looking glass and then to sigh as it were the more to the dear oh that is entertainment my bosom likes not nor my brows he calls his son the young mamilius over and starts scanning him for signs of illegitimacy and then glances back at his wife and friend still virginaling upon his palm, and he's referring to the virginals like, you know, playing a keyboard. Um, that's potentially significant to an allegorical reading of this play. Um, Elizabeth, again, who has been our theme throughout these classes, Elizabeth, the um, virgin queen, <laughs> excuse me, so the keyboard kind, and perhaps played the virginal as well. Well, anyway, Leontes becomes his own Iago, as uh, Harold Bloom has said, plagiarizing Harold Goddard. There have been, or I'm much deceived, says Leontes, cuckolds ere now, and many a man there is, even at this present now, while I speak this, holds his wife by the arm, that little thinks she has been sluiced in his absence, and his pond fished by his next neighbor, by Sir Smile, his neighbor. It is a body planet. A lord and confidant tries to reason with Leontes in this insane jealousy, saying there's nothing going on between Hermione and Polixenes, and um, Leontes bursts out with, is whispering nothing, is leaning cheek to cheek, is meeting noses, kissing with inside lip, stopping the career of laughter with a sigh, a note infallible of breaking honesty, horsing foot on foot, skulking in corners, wishing clocks more swift, hours, minutes, noon, midnight, and all eyes blind with the pin and web but theirs, theirs only, that would unseen be wicked, is this nothing? Why then, the world and all that's in it is nothing, the covering sky is nothing, Bohemia nothing, my wife is nothing, nor nothing have these nothings, if this be nothing. Well, that's pretty intensely nihilistic. This lord warns Polixenes that um, Leontes is out of his mind. Um, and Polixenes sees no recourse but to hightail it back to Bohemia at that point. So what we can say here so far is that we've got another play by Shakespeare in which the male protagonist conceives this murderous animosity against his wife, who is loving, and imagining her unfaithful to him on really the flimsiest of grounds, only to later be overwhelmed by remorse. And we've got Imogen from um, Cymbeline. We've got Hermione here in The Winter's Tale. We've got Desdemona in Othello. Um, and these are always the most saintly and faultless of Shakespeare's heroines. So, for the Oxfordian perspective, we can point to um, the dimension regarding Oxford and his wife, Anne Cecil, from whom he estranged himself for several years in the late 1570s and on when he can, became convinced that his first daughter was not his own. 
Um, in the second act, we start off with young Mamilius being left by his mother among the ladies of the court because she's actually gotten exasperated by him. Um, and they exchange wit with him, or he does with them. He's a very precocious kid, and with lady number two, he says, I love you better, not for because your brows are blacker, yet black brows, they say, become some women best, so that there be not too much hair there, but in a semicircle, or a half moon made with a pen. Something else in coded is going on there, but at least we have another reference to another dark lady in these plays, um, possibly Anne Vavasor initially with Oxford at the court. But in any case, Hermione returns, and she requests that Mamilius tell her a story. And he s asserts that um, a sad tale is best for winter. I have one of sprites and goblins. And then he begins to whisper the story to her. There was a man dwelt by a churchyard, and then he fades out because in comes Leontes and another discussion takes over our attention on stage. Um, we're never going to get any more of that tale, and uh, the boy's story, like his life very soon, is going to be cut short. So possibly in a way, I wonder if we could look at this play somewhat as um, just like Bottom in A Midsummer Night's Dream refers to Bottom's dream because it hath no bottom in it, in that when you have your own dream, you see everything else, but you don't see yourself. I don't know if that's true, but that's the notion of dream theory at the time. So I wonder if the rest of this play should be called Mamilius's Dream because it hath no Mamilius, and he just fades out. He just disappears. But the other thing I wonder about this, and I don't know what to make of it, and maybe some of you might, um, yeah, I'm, I'm seeing that there are some suggestions already happening here too, but there was a man dwelt by the churchyard. That's it. That's the winter's tale. In Twelfth Night, there's an exchange between Feste and Viola disguised, similarly um, referring to the same idea. Viola says lightly, do you live by the tabor? as a musician and entertainer. And Feste says, No, sir, I live by the church. And Viola asks, Art thou a churchman? And Feste says, No such matter, sir, I do live by the church, for I do live at my house, and my house does stand by the church. Well, that's not hilarious. It's not very funny. I guess it's, you know, slightly witty. But what is this obsession with living by a church in these plays? I'm not sure that's been resolved. <clears throat> at any rate... This um, phrase, um, a, the winter's tale, or the um, what this boy is telling, um, something like a fairy tale that we're beginning here, a diverting entertainment, is called largely for the amusement of women, children, and the old. And when that gets said by Stratfordian perspective, I still wonder if the play was meant to appeal to Elizabeth in all three capacities as a woman, a child, and an older person. Well, Leontes learns that Polixenes has fled, and that confirms his accusations for him. Hermione gives birth to a, ch a daughter prematurely, and Paulina, um, um, kind of an advisor but lady at the court, proposes that she may present this daughter that Leontes is denying as his own, and that might change his attitude. We do not know how he might soften at the sight of the child. So she convinces a jailer this is appropriate behavior, and we've also got another um, another um, Oxfordian connection, too, in December of 1577, when Oxford was estranged from his wife, convinced that that daughter wasn't his. A Duchess of Suffolk tried to present the baby Elizabeth to her estranged father, Edward de Vere, and like Paulina, Lady Suffolk seems to have had a kind of a high-handed manner, and it didn't work, nor does it work here, either. And Laontes insists this child is not his own, and he wants it gone. Paulina just keeps insisting the queen is honorable. She sets down the infant. Laontes goes into fits. Everybody's a traitor. The bastard has uh, got to be out of here. The Hermione's got to be burned. At one point, he refers to Paulina as Dame Partlet in his rage at her. And usual footnote explanations um, 
offer the same identical explanation in Henry the Fourth, Part One, where Falstaff calls Mistress quickly Dame Partlet too. These footnotes typically say that this Dame Partlet is a traditional name for a hen. So you see how rural farming in Stratford is integral to these plays. But Jesus Febreze, uh, this is no Stratford barnyard traditional name. A traditional name for a farm chicken in on a farm is, is Sunday dinner, um, not par Partlet. Partlet comes from Chaucer's Nun's Priest's Tale, Chanticleer and Partlet. It's a poetic tradition. At any rate, a paranoid Leontes babbles insanely about all these treacheries, like Brutus, Macbeth, Richard III, and others. He suffers from insomnia now. Perhaps burning his wife might help. He says, say that she were gone, given to the fire. A moiety of my rest might come to me again. He insists he's not going to rear another's issue, and so he has one of his lords take the child to dump into the wilderness to die. All right, we are at Act 3 now. Um, Leontes now puts his wife Hermione on trial. She's the daughter of a king, but she's accused and arraigned of high treason in committing adultery and conspiring. Now, earlier he'd also labeled her as an adulteress, a bed swerver, and a traitor, too. Some Shakespeareans start thinking about the trial of Mary, Queen of Scots. And it seems pertinent because, in terms of the eloquent defense Hermione makes, um, she echoes something Mary, Queen of Scots says. She points out that the double bind she's in of not being believed in the first place renders her in an impossible situation to defend herself effectively. Nevertheless, she lays out the issues and does insist that she is innocent. All right, now whether this old-fashioned Winter's Tale atmosphere is a real thing with this play, um, if it really does exude that kind of uh, feel, then shouldn't we be going back nostalgically somewhat or traumatically somewhat, um, and I'd say a generation not Mary Queen of Scots, but backwards, looking for a king guilty of outrageous over-the-top behavior and putting his wife on trial. <clears throat> One of the somewhat random comments made um, has been this by a critic. The Winter's Tale and Henry VIII are built on a paradox. Their women protagonists acquire increased moral authority even while they are being demoted and persecuted. Hmm. Well, interesting. Awkward, though. Doesn't this mean that Shakespeare has in mind, and the play almost dramatizes in a way, the Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn saga, um, Queen Elizabeth's parents? But indeed, you know, as awkward as it is, Anne was accused of these exact same crimes that Hermione is. Historian defenders of Anne Boleyn admit that sh there was enough circumstantial evidence that Anne had behaved indiscreetly, but in the high-charged atmosphere at court, chivalrous attention could be transformed by a gesture into passionate devotion. Um, the Catholic Church viewed Henry's marriage with Anne Boleyn as adulterous and considered Anne and Henry's daughter Elizabeth a bastard. Um, hence the rejection of the infant daughter in this play, perhaps. What's this doing in here? Well, if this is even approached by the traditional orthodox view, then what we say is, and here's a critic, Shakespeare as a boy is likely to have talked with old people who remembered hearing of the birth of Princess Elizabeth. That's it. Long forgotten, Horace Walpole in the late 1700s noted this when he saw a production of what was apparently then being billed as the Winter's Evening's Tale, but must have been this play. He says it was certainly intended in compliment to Queen Elizabeth as an indirect apology for her mother, Anne Boleyn. The subject was too delicate to be exhibited on the stage without a veil. And it was too recent and touched the queen too nearly for the bard to have ventured so home an illusion on any other ground than compliment. The unreasonable jealousy of Leontes and his violent conduct in consequence form a true portrait of Henry VIII, who generally made the law the engine of his boisterous passions. 
The Winter's Evening's Tale was therefore in reality a second part of Henry VIII. So once again, revisit the play. Um, Leontes in the previous act saying, is whispering nothing, is leaning cheek to cheek, is meeting noses, kissing with inside lip. Part of Anne Boleyn's indictment was, quote, inciting five men to have sexual relations with her by the use of touches and kisses that involve thrusting her tongue into their mouths and theirs into hers. So people started hating Anne Boleyn, um, not necessarily Shakespeare, but um, in the 1500s, the 1580s, um, Anne was declared to have had buck teeth, six fingers on her left hand, and a large lump under her double chin, and she was used as a whore by the principal courtiers of England and France, and she was a Lutheran. Uh, Paulina in the play says to Leontes about all of this, about this time, I'll not call you a tyrant, but this most cruel usage of your queen not able to produce more accusation than your own weak hinged fancy, something savors of tyranny, and will ignoble make you, yea, scandalous to the world. And so too, when Henry executed, beheaded Anne Boleyn, his reputation so comes down to us in that respect. All right. An oracle is brought in to the proceedings in the middle of the trial, and this is read. And usually these oracles are completely ambiguous, you know, like fortune cookies and horoscopes. But this one says, Hermione is chaste, Polixenes is blameless, Camillo a true subject, Leontes a jealous tyrant, his innocent babe truly begotten, and the king shall live without an heir if that which is lost be not found. It's almost comically blunt, but Leontes declares it's all crap and commands that the trial just keep proceeding. However, immediately a servant now enters and reports that Mamilius is dead. Immediately, Leontes repents. Uh, Apollo's angry and the heavens themselves do strike at my injustice. Um, Hermione faints at this news and Paulina bitterly tells Leontes, now watch her die too. You jackass. Paulina takes off um, Hermione and leaves. Um, Leontes does command that she is cared for it and he is grief stricken, but Paulina returns very quickly and rails at Leontes and reports that Hermione's died. Leontes agrees now that he will visit the burial chapel for his wife and son and um, says that once a day I'll visit the chapel where they lie and tears shed there shall be my recreation. And clearly he got this idea from Claudio uh, in Much Ado About Nothing. Well, The Winter's Tale emphasizes um, fathers and royal succession, we're told by some traditional critics and scholars, too, representing an ongoing conflict between James and his son Henry. Well, if we go dogmatically with that um, later 1611 reference to this play that comes on the scene and ignore the 1594 registration of this play and the suspicion that all the dating, the traditional dating of these plays is a hoax, then let's not think so much about these later days of um, King James, uh, but rather, once again, the Elizabethan generation. And Leontes boldly defines himself as a king, husband, and father. So if we're thinking of Leontes as Henry VIII and a dead prince, we almost have the situation of Mamilius, perhaps representing Edward VI, who died as uh, essentially a boy king. And interesting about that for our purposes in this play is that in uh, at, eventually Edward wrote in his personal chronicle that until he was six he was brought up among the women of the court and again he too died young so now the Lord Antigonus with the infant girl lands on a stormy sea coast as directed by Leontes before his repentance of Bohemia and Bohemia in Shakespeare's time didn't have a sea coast, and so Ben Jonson's having more fits about this violation of literalism. Um, scholars have noted since then that Bohemia did at one time, in fact, have a sea coast, so that's not necessarily a problem. Um, Marjorie Garber again from Harvard 
the Shakespearean there tries to dismiss this in a parenthetical comment. She says, well, ingenious critics have consulted old maps to demonstrate that Bohemia once did have a seacoast. But the phrase, the seacoast of Bohemia, has entered the language as the equivalent of never lever, never land, a place of utopian possibility. So, you know when you're bragging to somebody about all your accomplishments, but you're really full of crap, and that person will say, oh, you know what, you are so seacoast of Bohemia. This is the play that that comes from. I have never heard that phrase in my life. Marge. Anyway, Antigonus speaks of a dream he has had about the dead Hermione, who commanded him to call this child Perdita, which means the lost one. The babe is counted lost forever, and Evere, or Veer anagram, forever might be operating here, but Antigonus also calls her Blossom, speed thee well. So we've got flower imagery starting to attach itself to this child too, which um, you'll remember from last week, some of you, how potentially significant that will end up being. Then a storm begins and a bear chases off Antigonus. The arbitrary goofiness of all of this <clears throat> is famous. What's a bear doing on the coast anyway? What's a coast doing on Bohemia? But we've got the famous stage direction. After Antigonus states, I am gone forever, exit pursued by a bear. Exit pursued by a bear. <laughs> exit pursued by a bear. All right, a shepherd enters and comes upon the infant, checks it out, and adopts this changeling child. His son, um, introduced as a clown figure, just a rube, a rural, uh, reports w witnessing the death of this entire crew of the wrecked ship and then seeing Antigonus having been mauled by the bear. A daring interpretation from Oxfordian perspective has the shepherd and this clown um, representing John Shaxper and his son William. Um, perhaps this is a later addition to the play because the play does become structurally odd at this point in a number of ways I'll mention. But if that's the case, then later on this portrayal of them as completely ambitious for gentility might make some sense, and then it's tempted to con tempting to consider Perdita as what? The lost works? She's left with a scroll, and who is in possession of Perdita in that respect? The uh, rubes the older one to the younger one says, we are lucky, boy, to be so still requires nothing but secrecy. If we just shut up about this, we've got it made. All right, act four, the serenity, acceptance, which mark the vision of the romances is partly at least a matter of time perspective. The romances are plays we hear in which the relationship between the generations is seen as a relationship in time, and from one generation to the other, time is seen as the dimension in which wounds may be healed and life renewed. Time is accepted as the destroyer because time is also the agent of renewal. This rather bucolic scene begins with a personification of time actually on the stage serving as a chorus and introducing himself this way. I that please some, try all, both joy and terror of good and bad, that makes and unfolds errors, now take upon me, in the name of time, to use my wings. Impute it not a crime to me or my swift passage that I slide o'er sixteen years and leave the growth untried of that wide gap, since it is in my power to overthrow law, and in one self-born hour to plant an overwhelmed custom. But if he's adopting the name of time, or announcing himself coming in the name of time, then he's not time? What is his function here? To skip us over years and direct the plot? He's sounding more like the playwright, actually, in function. Well, during the passing of these 16 years, Leontes has become a recluse. Perdita has grown. Florizel, the son of um, Polixenes, becomes smitten with this shepherd girl, Perdita. And at a rural springtime festival, Polixenes is there detecting a kind of nobility in Perdita. Um, nothing she does or seems but smacks of something greater than herself, because we know she's actually a princess. Too noble for this place. 
If young Doricles do light upon her, she shall bring him that which he not dreams of, which is true, because we're still thinking of the princess in the play and possibly the princess Elizabeth with especially a lot of floral imagery coming up. So Florizel praises Perdita this way. What you do still betters what is done. When you speak, sweet, I'll have you do it ever. When you sing, I'll have you buy and sell so. So give alms, pray so. And for the ordering you affairs, to sing them too. When you do dance, I wish you a wave of the sea that you might ever do nothing but that. Move so, still so, and own no other function. Each you are doing, so singular in each particular. Crowns which you are doing in the present deeds that all your acts are queens. This is a tribute to Elizabeth, would work perfectly well, it seems like, and um, her alias that is adopted, that is Perdita's alias in this festival, is Flora, flower. So, in the world of romance, however, nature is stronger than nurture, and Perdita's inherited nobility asserts itself despite her low-class environment, we're told. Um... She's perpetually compared to a princess and unites the simplicity of the shepherd's daughter with that. Um, Perdita eventually thinks this is a little too much because she's so modest, um, and she takes up her, her you know, lentil parade and Pullman duties, um, but then drops them again and says resignedly, okay, I'll, I'll queen it no inch further. Now, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth herself, was apparently charmed and charmed those about her into participating in the sophisticated allegorical fantasy of the Virgin Queen, contriving to live out a mystical romance on the public stage. The musicians and poets praised her as fair Oriana, or as the immortal shepherdess of a pastoral, and the older she grew, the more delighted she was in this cult. It seems absolutely goofy to me, this, you know, royal, royal um, people and imagining the simplicity and joys of uh, uh, peasants and the hungry and uh, playing at being shepherds and shepherdesses but apparently as you like it and I guess this play too would be a way of appealing to Elizabeth um, the floral imagery might and the flattery might make Elizabeth pleased by thinking of herself in this role as a 16-year-old. But at this point, if um, I'm putting forth this notion of uh, Henry VIII and Elizabeth being relevant to it all, and Edward VI, Elizabeth's young brother who died on the throne before her, um, then... It's all very well, Delahoy, to say that this is a reconstructed Tudor, Tudor family then, but then where's Mary? What about Mary Tudor? She was in there, too. And I put forth this image to you, a painting called The Allegory of the Tudor Succession. And what you see at the center, of course, is Henry VIII. And on the right, to our right of him, is little Edward. And to the right further, then, is Queen Elizabeth, and then behind her are peace and prosperity and other allegorical figures, and you can see the bounty behind her. To our left is Mary and Philip of Spain, and behind them, war and strife, allegorically. So it certainly seems to me here that what we're putting forth is that we've got the Protestants, they're okay. Mary, that was an exception, and we're literally marginalizing her. So, the play does not have a Mary figure, but neither does that work of art. Meanwhile, Act 4, at this sheep-shearing festival, gloating over the suckers he's fleeced um, and calling the people the herd, comes a rogue named Autolycus. And he's singing songs and selling wares and picking pockets and reveling in all the slimy things he does. If tinkers have, may have leave to live, and bear the sow skin budget, a wallet or a bag, then my account I well may give, and in the stocks of outjet, that is, testify to my thieving trade. My traffic is sheets, because he sells paper, he sells ballads, too, which is intriguing. Um, the name Autolycus, etymologically, seems significant, too. Um, the auto part of his name, self, 
ought to provide a hint, um, and it has to a certain Oxfordians. Shakespeare is always about identity, and so when Otto is part of the name, um, beware. I would add that the name ought to signify something like self-enemy, because Autolycus, Lycus, Lycus, is etymologically related to Lechion, the first of the metamorphoses in Ovid's Metamorphoses, who tempts the gods or tests the gods and is punished by being turned into a wolf. So Lycaon gives his name to lycanthropy, werewolf studies. Wolf, though, because Western culture um, demonizes that animal, ends up in Anglo-Saxon especially being identical with enemy, wolf and enemy. And the uh, handy demonstration of that is Beowulf. Beowulf. Um, what his name means is enemy of the bee, Beowulf. And it, what what is an enemy of a bee? This is an Anglo-Saxon kenning or a compound metaphor for something else. And it's Beowulf's earned secret name. Um, how does he earn the name bee wolf? What is an enemy of a bee? A bear. And his first fight with Grendel does not involve a sword, which is, you know, the total Anglo-Saxon thing. Instead, he uses his grip. Autolycus is Earl. Um, Odysseus is grandfather, too, associated with trickery through uh, Hermes or Mercury, and um, I think thievery and deception there as well. So Shakespeare's drawing our name and attention to names and identities through this character, or names versus identities, shams and scams. Autolycus invents an alter ego who he claims is a thief and by whom he, Autolycus, has been victimized, and he even gives that rogue his own name, his fictitious rogue that he makes up, he gives the name Autolycus. So Shakespeare is outrageously pushing the limits of credibility here. Um, Autolycus comes across the shepherd's son, and he throws himself down on the ground and grovels before this guy, saying, oh, that ever I was born, oh, the evil in the name of me, utters the startled rube. Autolycus claims to have been beaten by a footman, robbed and made to wear these rags he's got on. And he describes the villain who so abused him, this Autolycus. I know this man well. He hath been since an ape-bearer, then a process server, a bailiff, then he compassed a motion of the prodigal son and married a tinker's wife within a mile where my land and living lies. And having flown over many knavish professions, he settled only in rogue. Some call him Autolycus. That's the rogue that put me into this apparel. Well, it sounds like um, kind of a sketchy job description of um, our friend, the grain merchant, William Shakespeare of Stratford. But the clown is sympathetic and gullible, and even more so when Autolycus refuses to take any money from him because he really hopes that the guy won't reach in his pocket because Autolycus has already picked that pocket. All right, so we join the festival. Um, there are simple girls there who like ballads and say, I love a ballad in print, for then we're sure that they are true. Whatever that means. Having things written down attests to their truth, we hope. Um, Autolycus is unique, we are told, um, in puncturing the illusions of print narrative rather than those of the theater. He does not play with words, but he sells them as a play broker might in London. Autolycus, pretending to be a courtier in the new clothes he has attained, then greets the shepherds again and grills them about where they're going. Let me have no lying. It becomes, becomes none but tradesmen, which he's pretending not to be one of. But that's been pointed out as odd because that's a Shakespeare's opinion of the class to which Shakespeare's father belonged, tradesmen. Always an aristocratic perspective in the Shakespeare plays. These rubes are absolutely awestruck by the snazzy-looking um, new Autolycus. He seems to be the more noble, they say, in being fantastical. A great man, I'll warrant. I know by the picking on his teeth. And this has been taken to be another identification of Oxford, self-identification of Oxford, too. The teeth-picking, using a toothpick, seems to have been one of his affectations. So, we proceed to the final act now. Act 5, Leontes is encouraged at this point to end his reclusiveness repeatedly and to forgive himself repeatedly. But not by Paulina. She keeps chiding him. 
If one by one, she says, you wedded all the world, or from the all that are took something good to make a perfect woman, she you killed would be unparalleled. Just the kind of thing you would want to say in front of Elizabeth to her now dead father about her mother, perhaps. And indeed, isn't that what Henry VIII kept doing, wedding one by one, on and on? In any case, Paulina also counters the proposal that Leontes remarry and create another heir. She says to him, care not for issue, the crown will find an heir. Again, we're reminded of Henry VIII's obsession about that. So, at this point, Florizel and now his beautiful wife Perdita, the most peerless piece of earth the heir of the sun shone bright on, are announced into the court of Leontes in Sicily. He welcomes them and laments that he has no son and daughter. He's reminded of that fact by their presence. Um, he's so pleased by this couple. He says only that um, she, Perdita, reminds him of Hermione. And he agrees that he's going to try to make peace between um, the father, Polixenes, his old friend, and the son, now, Florizel. The revelation that Perdita is Leontes' daughter doesn't even come now or later in any dramatic scene. It's reported by negligible characters. This is structurally odd, too, dramatically weird. Um, initially, um, this being reported secondhand instead of witnessed by us seems kind of outrageous, but Shakespeare possibly has learned from some other plays, like maybe Pericles, that one recognition scene should be enough, and he's saving it up for another one. So we find out that Leontes and Polixenes are also um, reconciled, um, and we see one more glimpse of Autolycus and the Rubes, who've all been rewarded for their parts in these revelations and for the Rubes taking care of Perdita all her life until now. Um, the Rubes are rewarded with laughingly inappropriate knighthoods. These shepherds profess themselves now gentlemen born. They've been made gentlemen born. Um, making a gentleman born is ideologically impossible, technically impossible, but that's what they want. We also now learn that Paulina, from you know these secondhand reports, hath privately twice or thrice a day, ever since the death of Hermione, visited that removed house where are kept, apparently, statues created by our friend from last week, Giulio Romano, that rare Italian master, Giulio Romano, who would beguile nature of her custom. Well, this is weird because this play is taking place in ancient times where we're praying to Apollo. It is not taking place in 16th century Italy. So all that I was saying last week about Giulio Romano being responsible for those paintings that have been attributed to Shakespeare's descriptions in The Rape of Lucrece pertains here, too. Shakespeare so likes this guy that he puts him forth inappropriately, anachronistically, just to mention his name here. Um, it's another case for Oxford having written these plays, having been to Italy, and knowing Mantua, especially, where Giulio Romano did his best work at the uh, Palazzo Ducali and the Palazzo del Te for the Gonzaga family. Um, we wander through this gallery of, of uh, sculptures and arrive at the statue of Hermione. Paulina draws back a curtain and says to everyone there present, which includes Leontes and his daughter Perdita, I like your silence. It shows more off your wonder. And while Leontes remarks on the statue having wrinkles, Paulina admits that it's been imaginatively aged by the artist. Leontes is absolutely guilt-ridden again, as he has been all along. Perdita kneels to the statue, hoping for its blessing in some futile way. And Paulina says, eh, don't touch! The paint hasn't dried yet. Um, it used to be fashionable to paint statues at, uh, in these previous centuries. Well, Leontes and Perdita are entranced by the statue. They don't want it covered up. Paulina cues some music and commands the statue to move. Hermione leaves the pedestal, walks towards Leontes, and embraces him, and he remarks, oh my god, she's even warm. Paulina remarks that she is living, or that she is living, were it but told you, should be hooted at like an old tale, but it appears that she lives. 
So it's never unambiguously clear what has happened here. Most critics figure that Hermione has never really been dead, just been kept sealed up, and Paulina has brought her meals for all this time of all this suffering. But is this some sort of, you know, symbolic resurrection or a Pygmalion story or what? Um, some critics now at this point propose that this play was revised for the wedding of James's daughter Elizabeth in 1613 because the statue business refers its Jacobian audience to recent developments in funerary art. But there was also a statue of Queen Elizabeth presented at Ludgate in um, 1586. Um, and I would say, connected to Elizabeth, let's go back to the earlier generation again. That seems meaningful. Think of Elizabeth reading herself into the Perdita character here. Um, the critics admit Perdita owes much of her inheritance to her mother. Thus, when she confronts Hermione's statue at the end, she is also confronting fully, for the first time, her own character. When the statue awakens into the living mother, Perdita awakens into the knowledge of her own nobility. It is therefore significant that Hermione's first and only words at the end of the play are addressed to her daughter, first evoking a blessing from the gods, and then wondering how she has been preserved. To an eerier degree, Elizabeth apparently never spoke of her mother, but she adopted her mother's motto, Semper Idem, ever the same, and apparently always carried a likeness or a cameo of her mother through her life. All right, so a summing up of The Winter's Tale has been rendered this way. The principal charm of The Winter's Tale, its real power over the sources of delight, lies in the two women, true mother and daughter, whose fortunes we see at certain moments, the really important crises in their lives. Um, Shakespeare, it is said, did not memorialize Elizabeth upon her death in 1603 just as he did not, except in passing or in epilogue, encomiate her while she lived. But that, of course, is absolute ru rubbish. He's always thinking of her, writing for her. Um, no more than by the last scene of Lear am I amused by the last scene of the Winter's Tale, says another critic. I believe Shakespeare has plucked his supreme fiction from somewhere much nearer the center of pain itself. So even though this final scene can be very effective emotionally, it still baffles everyone. I wonder if it isn't, in fact, not at all far-fetched, really, to think that Shakespeare would reconstitute, reconstitute this family in this way, in a way that it never actually took place. That is, that Elizabeth never knew her father and mother getting along, or reconciled, certainly, and certainly by the time she was 16, it was all long over. But this is what art can do. So here is another Tudor era image. What we have here is Henry VIII again in the middle with Prince Edward and Jane Seymour. But what is odd about this image? Well, it could never have taken place. This could not have been a tri-portrait painted at any time because Jane Seymour died shortly after the birth of Edward from childbirth, essentially, and here is this idealized, reconstituted family that art can provide. So what I am suggesting is that Shakespeare is doing the same thing, more activated on the stage in this play. And here is the psychological perspective that has been recognized as the potential of this play, but not applied as I want to do, to the um, situation of having Elizabeth being appealed to as Shakespeare's main audience member. Anybody who has suffered a bereavement can tell you what a tumult of distress and rapture can be stirred up by an unexpected snapshot, the sight of a face in the crowd, or a retreating figure which looks as if it might just have been the dead beloved. It can take years for this propensity to die with the dead. It is a radical ingredient in the human soul, and you will follow that retreating figure, knowing perfectly well that you're cultivating a delusion, yet preferring that delusion to anything the world can offer you in the way of solid reality. It is enough to feel again what you have been prevented for so long by brute fact from feeling. What you have feared, you may never feel again. 
that it is almost pure pain is negligible besides the heart-stopping sense of recovering and recapture. It is a pain for which you are hungry. So this is what Shakespeare, Oxford, is supplying for Elizabeth. It's a daring type of therapy, but Paulina does declare herself to Leontes as your loyal servant, your physician, your most obedient counselor, yet that dares less appear so in comforting your evils than such as most seems yours. She's declaring herself essentially what De Vere must have often found himself trying to do with Elizabeth, um, really pushing the line, being a pain in the ass, but helping her, risking everything for her betterment. So I read this as another play that specifically takes into consideration Elizabeth as the key audience member, obviously and probably blending her relationship with the play into Oxford's own in terms of the jealousy, as I see happening in Antony and Cleopatra and uh, other plays too. So here the Shakespearean theme of deluded marital jealousy matches De Vere's autobiographical impulse in, for example, Othello, but he invites Elizabeth perhaps to see her predilection towards the same thing and her own irrational fits too. But this time there's another layer as well. Despite all these anachronisms, the play is set in the distant past, so as I've been saying, let's go back a bit. I've been suggesting a generation. Isaac Asimov um, offhandedly noted that the original audience might have experienced a sense of familiarity with the trial scene of Henry VIII trying Catherine, or Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. Um, I say, and apparently the ignored Horace Walpole says, that Leontes partly is indeed daddy for Elizabeth, Henry VIII, who, like daddy, um, and herself, actually, flies into fits of irrational rage and essentially is responsible now for the death of mommy, Anne Boleyn, who is accused of infidelity and treason. So Elizabeth might well see herself in Leontes, in King Henry, in whatever fit of hysterical jealousy Oxford is advising against her having at the original time. And of course, Oxford is Leontes regarding his own wife, so once again, he's diplomatically demonstrating how alike he and Liz are. The son Mamilius made so much of as a royal heir in the first scene of the act dies young as Elizabeth's younger half-brother, whose early death ultimately meant that she would eventually succeed to the throne. Daughter Perdita gets to play the ingenue shepherdess, um, and again, I, although I would have thought the whole dorky pastoral thing would have been more a hobby of courtiers than Elizabeth herself, apparently she liked it and gave the impression that she went in for it too, as, as you like it in this play suggests. Um, the Catholic Mary Tudor is ignored in this family reconstruction, and they pointed to that Tudor-era painting where the marginalization is literalized. So, the world goes gaga over the wondrousness and wisdom of the innocence and horticultural wit of Perdita, Flora, and Elizabeth gets to be 16 years old again, and she finds out, you know what, Daddy really did love Mommy and is very, very sorry that he killed her. And Mommy even comes back, and Auntie Paulina says, care not for issue, the crown will find an heir. Don't worry about it. And so then, the comforting power of art. Though tragedies happen, people do terrible things, and life can be very hard. Redemption, reconciliation, and forgiveness are still possible. The Winter's Tale is a play about the healing power of time and of love. Some of these statements seem insightful. They never really know why, um, but I think this Tudor family drama might explain much. So, there she is. There's what I said a moment ago about the importance of it. Here, I think, is an important engraving of Oxford's devotion to Elizabeth. And here's me. <laughs> All right, thanks. Now, that's what I've got to say when I'm blabbing alone. But if I put my ears back in, perhaps I'll be hearing from you. Yes? <laughs> All right, Henry fell on his head in the joust and possibly damaged his brain. Probably lots of concussions when you joust. Jumping to concussions, no. Um, during the week when Jennifer first uh, knew what I was up to here with this presentation, 
she uh, she was so convinced that she did detect Leontes, uh, King Henry the Eighth in Leontes, that she said she could almost smell his leg wound. Okay, I'm trying to see what comments I've been missing. Okay, yeah, Ovid's Metamorphoses is everywhere, even tucked away here in this play. Sounds like the strap man, gentleman born. Yeah, that was in anticipation of where I was, in fact, wanting to go. Essex got into trouble for making too many nights without ER's permission, too, in addition to the bought title for You Know Who. It helps to see art as they did. Um, yeah, there was a bit of this last week, too, about that compression that you can do in time and space. So you're seeing images that never happened at the same time, or people in the same frame that never could have been together in that way at that same time. Um, it was true of, if I'm right in reading The Death of Patroclus and Achilles rising out of that in last week's Julia Romano images, and then so, too, these... Um, the Jane Seymour Edward image here, then art has a much, much better function than just literally portraying a snapshot that can actually take place in reality. What is the point of that? What is the point of literalism? Um, the early modern period heads us towards it, but alas, what is the meaning of a newspaper? Did Elizabeth have a Paulina? Um, was um, Cat Ashley, is that her name? I don't know what kind of um, personality. Uh, if I got their name right, Cat Ash Ashley, I don't, I don't know what kind of personality she had, but certainly Elizabeth trusted her and would have, she would have been a Paulina if, you know, somebody had to smuggle Elizabeth food for 16 years. I, I get the sense that there was that kind of long-term devotion between the two of them. Screenwriting compresses time and combines characters too to create a compelling hero's journey. Yeah, exactly, and it can have a much it can have an effect, and it and I just it's that the fact that art can create meaning does not mean that the meaning itself is made up and subjective and spurious. What do you do with raw material if you don't do something with it that? tries to make it make meaning. I have been at war with meaninglessness for years, but we get more and more comfortable with meaninglessness, um, and it's disturbing. This doesn't mean anything. This was just tossed off, written for money. Do I think the Hermione resurrection is similar to Harrow's if Leontes is like Claudio? I, there's got Shakespeare seems to be working something through uh, throughout some plays, and he does this on a number of themes. From the very beginning, it seems, even revisions of very early plays, he's just trying to work something out about the notion of a tempest to the very end. He gets on this notion of food, which is celebrated in Antony and Cleopatra, and then in Twelfth Night, if music be the food of love, play on, because I want to be sick of it and push past it. And then in Troilus and Cressida, the food thing becomes actual vomit. Um, he just like goes through these arcs of thinking through these themes. And uh, certainly another one um, is this fake death that takes place, or the, you know, the 
temporarily botched fake death of um, Romeo and Juliet. And the critics have a similar trouble with uh, that notion of Harrow's death. So you have this friar say, hey, I've got a good idea after the shaming scene of Much Ado About Nothing. Let's pretend she's dead. And then we all think, oh, no, please, when a friar says, you know, let's pretend to be dead, you think, oh, yeah, right, nothing could go wrong. But the only way to explain that is not just the psychological torment that we want to um, inflict on Claudio and make him appreciate her better because that's pretty extreme. Um, the only thing you can do is say, okay, there has got to be some kind of dimension here that is symbolic death and resurrection. And so when Hero comes back, um, she died, my lord, but while her slander lived, is what Le uh, Leonardo says. Uh, so Shakespeare's got to be thinking thinking through, but possibly not even very successfully, what does this symbolic death mean? Uh, so I do think it's connected here. I don't know that he ever really, it ever really gels in a way that it makes sense both um, dramatically and psychologically for the audience. But um, fake death. Oh, we should be Marlovians. Um, or Oxfordians, I'm starting to wonder, too, actually. Just wondering at the moment. Um, yeah, you know, um, Euripides' Alcestis is the sources for both the final scenes of Much Ado and W.T., Winter's Tale. And I think, Earl, you wanted to see this image, if that's showing up, Earl Showerman sent Jennifer and me this image relevant to the uh, Alcestis source of this play. And possibly, my chat is paused. If I resume, resume chat, Maybe Earl will come on the screen or explain the significance to, of this. And maybe Jennifer will persuade him. Um, does any artist do anything that casually, anything casually or meaningless? I think not. Who would spend that kind of time for no reason? Yeah, and yet that seems to be sort of the story we get of um, Shakespeare as Shakespeare that, you know, that just comes up with stuff randomly, tosses it off, and he's doing it all because you can make such big money in the arts. Okay, Earl suggests we read his article in the first Brief Chronicles, and I did! And it's excellent and scholarly as always. Yes, Johnson seems to think Marlowe should be buried with Shakespeare. Um, what else? What a very queer image. Why is her foot crossed? And what is she doing with her hands? Well, this is uh, an image of an actress I believe playing um, her role in Winter's Tale. Um, but the indications are that there's acknowledgement here of the source, the Greek source, for the play also. Hamlet complains about Rosencrantz and Guildenstern thinking they can play him like a flute, but is Devere playing Elizabeth when he hits her with one of his personally resonant, resonant plays? Um... You know, I think it's like these very savvy sonnets that come out, too. He's not playing her, or yes, he is playing her, but she knows it, and she knows he knows it, and he knows she knows he knows it, and so it's absolutely delightful. Um, since I've been mentioning uh, As You Like It tonight a couple times, I think that's a good example. You've got those two characters in the woods, and most productions assume that Rosalind knows what she's doing, and Orlando, as it, doesn't know that she is actually playing herself because he thinks she's a boy. But I don't think so. What if you played it like we are entering 
consciously into playing these roles upon roles. And nobody's fooling anybody, really, but there's this delight in being able to play, even play yourself. So there's a lot of these sonnets um, in the 1590s by Drayton and other guys trying to outdo each other, where they adopt this persona and they put on this act of thinking that they're getting away with these clever seductions which actually come off like sour grapes, you know, breakup sonnets. But the it's not that those things are going to work, it's that everybody smirks because you know that they see through the tactics of it all. Okay, so if that's the case, and I do think Elizabeth had appreciation of that respect, um, then all this playing of roles and playing, nobody's fooling anybody right at the center, but there is absolute delight in, pre in pretending that you think you are fooling anybody because it's all the act and all the energy that goes into the act. Play, but pretend we're serious. Here, I'll cut off your head. <laughs> Yes, it pushes the envelope when you're getting uh, to these central matters. But you know what? What else is there? There is no therapy. So Oxford constantly saying that you know his role as a fool or a clown um, or a courtier, a corrupter of words, these are all the therapists of the play. Feste and Jakes and um, you know a lot of the... the the fool in Lear, a lot of these clown characters are actually functioning um, better than what you end up with later, which is personal counselors and therapists, psychiatrists. Um, and again, it's intrinsically has to do with identity, not being so rigid that you have only this one narrow identity and are just a fossil um, but explore yourself through acting but not to the point of Hollywood stars where you have no sense of self whatsoever and you can enter in any role um, and you just dilute yourself to the other extreme so a sense of identity has to be a little bit fluid but not completely uh, evaporated and that's what I think um, Oxford recognizes is the power of theater, play, roles. Okay. Allegorical lockpicking became a courtly obsession during the reign of QE1. I have missed some chat, clearly. Oh, the idea of catharsis. Absolutely. I think that's what I, that, that's a dimension of what I'm getting at at the end of this play with the potentially troubling scene of, you know, seeing an image of your queen mother who was killed by your father so many years ago. This there fear is of course his own therapist. Sorry is there a Okay. Um what else? Oh, my chat's paused. Nothing can stand against the assault of laughter, Mark Twain. Oh, and a while ago, Jennifer mentioned celebrity roasts. Um, yeah, actually, uh, the fact that you are insulting people but getting away with it and it's all supposedly good-natured and to the extreme when you're an insult comic too um, and you can go into these railing modes where vitriol just spills from you it's a delight to see but we audience members delight to see it because it seems like it's spontaneous it's pouring forth it's just a raw emotion and it's rage and it's delight but we also know in the back of our minds that this has been crafted somewhat too there might be an element that is um, that changes every night, or that is ad lib. But in, in essence, the whole thing has been crafted. Shakespeare invented that. Shakespeare does that himself. And the longest rail is in King Lear, where this character just goes on insulting this person, uh, 
for lines and lines and lines it just spills forth but we know that Shakespeare is always um, admir admiring the railing characters even the dark ones like Timon of Athens but Feste is called uh, there's no slander in a loud fool though he do nothing but rail Feste doesn't even rail much but Oxford so identifies with these characters who rail that it makes sense that he on the record has been accused of railing endlessly at dinner parties and so forth so that railing aspect also I think is therapeutic is the it's the intersection of therapy and art um, let's see and doesn't Twelfth Night Yellow Stockings refer to Henry VIII wearing yellow after the execution of Anne Boleyn? QE for bad yellow, I believe. You know what? I so want this to be true. I so want there to be an element of literalism in Twelfth Night that Oxford is recording how they actually got away with telling Christopher Hatton that Elizabeth would love it if he wore yellow in front of her and that he actually <laughs> fell for it. And the Twelfth Night is partly just uh, a semi-fictionalization of a practical joke that they got away with. Because if you can imagine Elizabeth actually seeing someone dancing around in front of her, a courtier is trying to win her favors in yellow, the color associated with Henry's celebration of the deaths of his queens. Nice work, <laughs> practical jokers. I don't remember any yellow in um, this play at all. Um, let's see. Yeah, maybe just showing the practical joke in a play was nearly as good as pulling off the joke. But, oh, that would be so good. Um, I'm wondering if there are any strats lurking here, and if so, what they think of all these Oxfordian connections. Yeah, I do too, actually. So like to him that got it, if thou hast the ordering of the mind too, amongst all colors, no yellow in it, lest she suspect, as he does, her children, not her husband's. Oh, so yellow is associated with this. Um, this rage, jealousy, Leontes. I did not pick up on that. Thanks. Demir Devere might too have been therapist to the insane by virtue of being an earl. He was welcome to visit the asylum near Fisher's Folly, Bedlam, Bethlehem Hospital. Well, and Shakespeare thinks about insanity and not just extremes of emotions but actual insanity that Lear begs not happen to him okay um, this camp comes up too let me add one more uh, oddity to the discussion in this play this happens Hermione and Polixenes are strolling back and detecting that something's amiss in Leontes in that first act. And Leontes just passes it off as mere nostalgia for his youth and says, Looking on the lines of my boy's face, methoughts I did recoil twenty-three years. Then those messengers go to the Delphic Oracle, and we hear from them for a moment, and they say, Twenty-three days they have been absent. And then um, when we first hear from the um, shepherd, he comes out griping about young people, saying, I would there were no age between 10 and 3 and 20, or that youth would sleep out the rest, for there is nothing in between but getting wenches with child, wronging the ancient tree, stealing and fighting. So three times, and each case absolutely unnecessarily arbitrary, do we hear the number 23. I wonder if anybody had any thoughts about that. All right, I'm seeing Leontes anagrams. Leontes attests the lion. 
What year was Oxford? 23. Well, I also wonder, um, I wondered about plugging in the 16 to this too, and you know, 16 years from what for Elizabeth? Does that make any sense? 23 years from what for Elizabeth as a clue? Um, 23 years from the death of Anne Boleyn, um, and I'm just not, it's just not clear what that's about. I think at some point. Well, 23 is, yeah, 23 is a prime number, and there are articles about uh, the weirdness of number 23. There's a movie about the number 23. It's a, it's a key superstitious enigmatic number that crops up a lot for those into numerology. Um, Sixteen years for Henry Rosely. How old was Elizabeth when she became queen? Uh, yeah, I think Jennifer's right, 25. Um, the problem is that we have no idea about when this play appears uh, originally or when it was written, and it does seem to me to make a lot of sense that we've got a revision here, that the decision not to give us a dramatic scene of the reconciliation of Perdita and her father in favor of this animated scene at the end interacts with that Pandosto by uh, Green, that work that is often declared to be the source of Shakespeare rather than vice versa, or rather than that Shakespeare went back to his own earlier version of this work and we've got another layer of it because of the Concerns about identity, where we introduce these extra characters, the imbalance of it all. Act four is like as long as the first three acts all put together. Uh, so it seems like it's been messed with in revision and not really ironed out in every key aspect. So therefore, that's just going to mess up more of these attempts at dating or finding out when did he add the 23s, when did he add the shepherd, when did he add the statue, when did he, and so on. Um. Yeah, people are wondering if John D is involved in this and saying that that's always exciting when we've got numer numerical significance coming up and he's the guy to be looking at. Um, and yeah, I was going to mention, if I didn't burble it out already, the 23rd Psalm is um, a famous one too. Uh, I'm, other than, I guess, yeah, the shepherd's connection there, I wonder... I wonder, yeah, why? Is there more? Is there more? Why that one? Thematically with this play. Um, boy, I wonder what happens if I put on air some of these comments that are showing up down below. Will I disappear? Will I get myself in deep trouble like I did two weeks ago? Yeah, I <laughs> I don't dare. I don't dare mess. All right, we've got <laughs> shut up and not shut up and just kidding. <laughs> Every time I click, my chat is paused. How can you pause chat, I wonder? Any other 23 speculations? Any other aspects of this play that you wonder about? Heather's Q is above you. Heather's Q is above me. Ooh. <laughs> above me, like in front of me. I see I see questions down below. Uh, I don't dare put them on air unless I already did somehow. Or below. Never mind to me. That's the question. Is Psalm 23 annotated in De Vere's Bible? 
I don't know. And beyond this play, any other questions of me? Because, I mean, after all, it's the end of the semester. And um, I'm happy to answer any questions you've got now before the final exam. Does any artist do anything that, that casually or meaninglessly? And I say no, no artist does anything casually or meaninglessly. I don't, I find it hard to believe anybody does anything casually and meaninglessly. Belief in meaninglessness is a, a increasingly popular cop-out that it's easy to let us off the hook if nothing means anything and we're just careening around the pool table as billiard balls. But anything that an artist does or anything that any of us does that takes that kind of energy and produces something not even near a Shakespeare play but some some kind of production something that produces something that we're proud of that we're happy with there is intrinsically got to be meaningless meaning in that and um, ah, do I do anything casually Sometimes my mind drifts elsewhere when I'm walking the dog than actually being very present for that. But anything I actually do, like or print out or put on a web page or uh, cook for myself, no, it is it is always meaningful. All right, I will check Roger's book. Will you teach another course? Well, that can't be for me. That's got to be for Matthew seven eleven. Yeah, Matthew. We'll get we'll get him in here. Uh, oh, I don't know who else it is. Will I teach another course? Yeah, tomorrow three times, um, ten, eleven, and one. I got going, and probably they got plans for me next semester too. But maybe that's not what you mean. Aren't Leontes and Polixenes the same very character? Uh, you know, not only that, but there are other kinds of combinations here too. It's significant, perhaps, that the uh, the shepherd's son says when he saw when he saw the initial mauling of um, uh, Antigonus, the bear was ripping out his shoulder, and later on, when Autolycus throws himself down, he says, "Oh, you know, I got I got my shoulder hurt in this assault upon me." So there's, there are other kinds of odd connections there. Um, Paulina ends up at the end of the play being matched with uh, the surviving Camillo. So she lost a lord and she gets another lord, and it's almost like a kind of a semi-resurrection there, too. It doesn't do any good to invent meanings, and you can't, and you can take any number and make some nonsense out of it. Yes, you can, but it ends up being nonsense. And when you actually think things through and keep thinking things through, and more and more appends itself and makes more and more sense of it, and you have breakthroughs and epiphanies, then you're on the right paradigm. 23 mentioned three times. Yeah, exactly. Um, I could tell you several more meanings to 23, but they would not likely be relevant. Yeah, there are a lot of occurrences of 23, 23, 23, not that Shakespeare would have been aware of initially, but it's got to mean something to him. I just think because these instances are so random and unnecessary. I mean, why do we have to have these messengers riding 23 days? Why do we even know, need to know how many days they were riding? So... Psalm 23 is not annotated in the Geneva Bible, but on the other hand, you know, maybe it's so famous that we don't even need our notes. It uh, often seems like it's the obscure passages that Oxford's annotating. All right, Alan tells us 23 times 3, the reason that significance that that is 69 is the Royal Arch Mason's ubiquitous code for 69 um, that turned on its side is a sam uh, symbol for um, as he's shown the cusp of Gemini to cancer meaning June 24th 64 
and we visited that, um, I guess, two weeks ago, when I should have credited Alan at that time, if I didn't, with bringing forth a lot of this to my awareness. It's John the Baptist's feast day. It is Midsummer Day. June 24th is ostensibly when Oxford died in 1604. 624 represents the number of the letters in Earl of or Oxford of Earl, Earl of Oxford backwards, and Edward de Vere. <laughs> Apparently writing a musical for dwarfs, and I'm using character names of my son and his friends, and there is no connection. I just needed some names. Title coming up short, of course. Well, 400 years from now, some crackpot like me will think there really was a connection, actually. And are you so sure that there isn't actually a connection anyway? Jennifer, too, like I do, invites anyone to venture on camera if... Oh, not if. Just do it. I put myself, my face, <laughs> oh, it is. The 23rd is coming up. All right, I'm going to have to go all uh, romper room here and call on people. The other Jennifer, you know who you are. You got a camera, a little green dot. Come on. What's next? I'm going to reheat my roasted Brussels sprouts from last night and put it on some quinoa, I believe. I break cameras. All right, you break cameras, then you're off the hook. My browser does not support the camera. Well, that must be a pretty heavy camera. I missed the first two nights. How can I see, listen to the preview, previous ones? They're gone. Words in air. That's the beauty of this. That's the importance of actual face to pixelated face time like this and a class. It just can't be replicated. It's a matter of presence and the experience of it and being there. Hey. Oh, no. I'm hearing. Uh, 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 uh. For a moment. Was that an accident? <laughs> Come back. <laughs> ah, a glimpse of Kathleen when I finally scan back up again. Why do we need a tempest and a bear? One reference to nature should be enough. Are we missing some bear in joke? Yeah, I didn't go into this because I've never found a satisfactory explanation of a bear. Um, some of the uh, attempted explanations are pretty extreme. Like, um, well, Elizabeth liked bear baiting, so let's throw one in. Or the bear as a symbol of um, not just uh, in, uh, the ferociousness of nature, but some aspect of royalty. Uh, but these all seemed like uh, grasping at straws. And uh, even though, I guess, uh, Shakespeare, and we're talking about meaning and meaninglessness, too, it seems to me that Shakespeare is constitutionally unable to be meaningless and write nonsense. So even songs that seem tossed off or seem to be just, you know, shoved in to fill out a scene usually have two or three possible significances, especially once you're looking at this with the Oxfordian perspective. The only time I think that Shakespeare actually writes a line that is meaningless 
is when Benedict says, hmm, I am bid to come see you into dinner. There's a double meaning in that. And that's the only time like there's not a double meaning or a triple meaning or a quadruple meaning. But about this bear then, um, it does come off as, um, you know, even as what I think Marjorie Garber intends to say um, about the Bohemian seacoast is that it, it it ends up seeming as if it is quintessential meaninglessness or quintessential arbitrary ridiculousness. Yeah, the bear's the symbol of the Earl of Leicester. There's this little image of, uh, I think, a bear chained to a post or something, too. Um, and, and, and then the application is is what if if the if Lester is then somehow woven into this play then we must have lost some of those scenes later on after he's dead and this play is revised yeah a ragged staff right not a post that's the Earl of Lester's symbol um, the bear I got nothing. But I will not agree that it is meaningless. Yet. Is there a ragged staff in Winter's Tale? Not that I know of. Oh, and here is Anne trying to make me click a link that will take me away and shut me down. I understand. But I can't, I can't do it. I understand you wanting me to shut up, but I cannot click on something because I'll just disappear and Jennifer will really get mad this time for real. And she may not, may not invite me back <laughs> for any more clip. Oh, right. <laughs> Never mind. Henry VIII built Bear Arena at Whitehall. Um, very possible, yeah, because um, it's not just Elizabeth liking bear baiting, but... Uh, yeah, Henry the Eighth too. Yes. Certainly, De Vere has no warm feelings towards Lester. Um, but then why let let him get away with killing a perfectly loyal servant? Who I don't know. To what extent is um, Antigonus Oxford? except fleetingly, um, the Antigone, the agony of being hmm, of being that kind of courtier. It would work for Oxford if you think of Perdita the baby as the works being dropped off and abandoned and then him being mauled and removed from the scene and these things being raised by somebody else, but then to what extent is Lester responsible for that? Hermione will thwack him hence with distaffs. Oh, nice. I think it was just a joke. The bear? Very possibly. It's just a it's just a complete bit of goofiness. Or maybe he just wanted to send Ben Johnson into fits of apoplexy. <laughs> Violating the you know, whatever codes we're supposed to be following there. Nothing is meaningless. There was no waste time to waste. You had the stage. You had the attention of the audience, the eye and ear of the queen. You didn't waste an opportunity to meet your goals. Yeah, and yet, you know, Shakespeare is wasting our time all over the place, but only because in the last analysis he's writing literature um, in addition to drama. So all those bits that are left out when you are doing your productions or your films often as um, Harold Goddard recognizes that's where the real Shakespeare is so it slows down the drama it stalls the conversations and yet you know it's really important to pay attention to what Benedict is saying apropos of nothing at the moment about immortality and tooting your own horn um, why do we bother with the this Lord and having his debate about what makes a good dog in the opening scene with Christopher Sly before we get the play within the play of tem Taming of the Shrew. So nobody knows what that's for, and they chuck it. But it's in those bits that if you are really, um, you know, if you really are a better dog, you're sniffing out the better, subtler sense. Um, that's where Shakespeare often resides and hides his most important commentaries.
literature as a waste of time. Where does that come from? Not from me. I keep pausing my chat. Resume my chat, please. How about a new class by Michael as a waste of time in the literature? <laughs> My wife says he had too much time on his hands, and so do you if. <laughs> is addictive. Anything else? Nobody seems to want to dare peek out of the darkness surrounding me. And Jennifer doesn't want to end it. Okay. Does the name Antigonus appear elsewhere in literature? You know, just what is Earl still around? See, Antigone is Oedipus's daughter. She's got a dilemma. The camera makes my browser crash. Okay, okay, understand. What year do I think the first version was written? This one really eludes me. Um the Elder Ogburns are good at detecting these layers or this palimpsest effect where there's this overwriting of something going before and they often are pretty good at um, having anticipated by many decades what I come across and then realize oh they already thought this through so Antony Cleopatra they have like three separate stages that because of topical references and what's going on with Oxford make a whole lot of sense but this play is elusive. Um, I just do not have a sense of what would have prompted, like last week with Lucrece, I could see, you know, why why does it come out like it does as a poem, and why is it so dire? With this one, I think there's been so much rewriting of, the, especially the latter acts, that um, like a lot of the plays seeming to emerge out of maybe court entertainments that were shorter and then joined together so you get these two plots like Twelfth Night has the disguise plot and then it has the revelers plot joined together you can see how that were, would be unraveled and they could be two separate earlier entertainments or plays revels plays um, but now Shakespeare has to write for the public stage and these things have to last longer so he puts two of them together the jealousy plot that just sort of ends in Leontes uh, um, repentance um, that only be because of the characters and because of the you know superficial weird strained plot relationships ends up being connected to the other plot that we go into with all these other characters so um, I think because of that I end up with a, only a very foggy sense that there really are two two times where the approach to the play has uh, changed its purpose. Uh, but when that is, I need to still keep thinking about it. All right, now we've got some Antigonus stuff, comparable to his father, worthy of his father. Um, son of Philip was a Macedonian nobleman, gentleman, under Alexander the Great. Shakespeare keeps coming back to and pondering. During his early life, he served under Philip II, who was a major figure in the wars of the Dion after Alexander's death, declaring himself king and establishing dynasty. Antigonus' son, Demetrius, the besieger, was worshipped in Athens after he freed the city from oppression. Wilson's Uncrowned Kings of England, so also more material on the Dudleys as bears. Um, 
where's the Antigonus connection going? That's what I wonder. Nothing's occurring to me about it. So the worthy of his father, the family connection there, of course, we'd like to rope that in, but Antigonus doesn't have one. And if it purely it has to be his father, then anyone's father, then we want Edward. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious why Antigonus is pursued by the bear. Yeah, we still are. Molina says that Alexander left it for the worthiest to inherit an indirect compliment to her husband. And Antigonus, the one-eyed. We are just two comments away from figuring out Antigonus and the bear. Right? So I don't know if this shows up, but Heather says, Catherine, you crack me up on a list of comments I've got outside of the chat box. And it is true. So Antigonus hides a royal child, and I'd better run from the bear. Bear baiting. Is he Cecil? Yeah, you know, this is the play, except for that um, Cecilianum potential reference that goes nowhere. This is a play without a Cecil in it. Maybe that's why it's so weird. I did not, did not know that Devere sponsored bear baiting. I'm a little bit disappointed. Because I think, at least later on, when he thought about things a little bit better, he wasn't being so dismissive about Pythagoras. And certainly Ovid twists everything in the 15th book of Metamorphoses to be able to put forth Pythagoreanism, vegetarianism, metempsychosis, the transference of souls, reincarnation, essentially. And therefore, kind of a early animal rights. Grizzly bear baiting in California not so long ago. Oh, yeah, was it Lester baiting? Lester writes advocacy. Nah. <laughs> Bear baiting, isn't that a bit too obvious? Okay, and it is peculiar too that we hear a bit about this in terms of the bear going after the first bit of mauling takes place by ripping out the shoulder of um, um, Antigonus too. So it's not just uh, this one-off peculiarity. It seems as if there's this constellation of oddities in begging to be explained symbolically somehow or connected symbolically somehow. So you want to throw in the shoulder. I don't know where the name Antigonus ended up going. We're still trying to juggle around, shake some sense out of the bear reference, and then shoulder blades, a shoulder 
as I say, um, later on, there's a mention of the, the aching shoulder by um, Autolycus, claiming that he's hurt from being robbed by Autolycus. guess I could blab aimlessly. Well, not too many people here will remember that this started out as a presentation at the Portland conference 10 years ago. And this is one that I have never gotten in good enough shape to present again. And I did not have it in good enough shape to turn it into an article like a lot of the other presentations I've been able to do until today because of the desperation and panic of getting this ready. So now it, I think it's in much better shape and one more time through ought to make me able to distract myself from doing all the other work that I should be doing by cranking out yet one more article. The shoulder may refer to Pelops' shoulder eaten by Diana when she served to the, uh, when served to the Olympians by Tantalus yeah, who ends up tantalized in the underworld. Roger says to think about the bear and authority. Yeah, that's the that's the association I had. I had forgotten. Um Well, that may be a dead end. Other topics, other questions, other faces other than mine or other. Okay. I'd like to say on camera, I want to acknowledge the both of you. This is from Kathleen. But, you know, Jennifer asked for Lester Wright's advocacy. And then she left. She's at dinner somewhere. and I'm abandoned. And she had somebody type, I'm here, without an apostrophe. And I don't believe it because... Ah, trying to learn Kathleen back. All right, I understand. So I didn't see when those messages came in from someone wanting to say on camera, This has been, will there be an Oxfordian edition of The Winter's Tale? You know what? There will be an Oxfordian edition of absolutely everything and apocryphal plays and um, everything that you want. It's not in the works. It hasn't been started. But I, I cannot die without seeing this happen. So... Nobody else does it. I will sucker people in, form a team, we'll be a group, and get everything done as a group. Will there be an Oxfordian edition of The Winter's Tale? There is time again. There is time again. Well, 
the Oxfordian additions. Um, because in Ashland next September, the Shakespeare Oxford Fellowship holds its conference and we'll be seeing, or have available to us, a production of Antony and Cleopatra. My main commitment this year is to have Antony and Cleopatra, the Oxfordian edition, ready for... Do you buy stuff like that? Well, anyway, done. Done in existence, in reality, like, uh, like, like a book. And I'm addicted. I um, perhaps should not say that I have worked on editing Twelfth Night um, when I got stalled on Antony and Cleopatra. So um, even though Winter's Tale isn't in the works, a vague promise can be made. So many typos in the folio, possibly it was meant to mean an exit pursued by a boar. Groups are good. Yeah, no, groups are good. Except when you're trying to write a play. Oh yeah, time. Okay, right. Time. That's what you're trying to say. Time, the time element again. And uh, time as a character, it's artificial character in this play. Also, I threw a half-baked notion out there, and then I also didn't know what to do to follow through on it. But at the beginning of Act 4, like I say, time itself presents itself as a character as a chorus and says, I am time and I'm going to jerk you around and plop you down 16 years later because I can do it because I'm time. Um, but as I said, it seems as if time, if it's coming in the name of time, then it's not time, and then who is in charge of where we are violating the Aristotelian unities, um, and that's the playwright, or who's in charge of the, the plot of all of this. So Oxford is presenting himself as time. I can say a bit about what he does with time in other plays and how he likes to play with time, too. But I still am not quite seeing how it is coherent in this play, like all these things that we keep trying to make sense of, like the bear, like the coastline of Bohemia. Countess Asquith says time is Cecil. Maybe that's where he is, residing. We're defending Oxford and his boar from the depiction of chasing the baby's protector away. Whether that baby is Elizabeth or the works or both. Where is that time equals Cecil business? Jennifer is asking. Yeah, and I'm not familiar with that either. Um, time. Time ends up being a big deal in the calendar, too, but time ends up being a big deal in Julius Caesar, and there's this famous anachronism there about, you know, chiming bells ringing and all of that that wouldn't have taken place. Um, but some Oxfordians have said that that's absolutely intentional, that Oxford's thinking in terms of time and the calendars. 
um, more artistically, time is a special effect used as a special effect in Macbeth, where Shakespeare gives us the sense that we're missing things, that we've skipped over things, that there's no time, and Macbeth gripes about this too, opposite of Hamlet saying that would be scanned. Macbeth says, you know, there's just no time to scan this. We have to act. We can't think about it. We'll think about it afterwards once we overleap or we vault over the the act and the time itself. So you get this nervous sensation from watching, experiencing uh, Macbeth because Oxford is so interested in the effects of time and then mastering those effects to create his own special effects for us. Shakespeare is a closet Catholic. I'm willing to go with that, but you know what? It's all about the the aesthetics of Catholicism, and it, I just I don't know that he cares all that much about the religious aspect of it, um, and certainly was preyed upon for the aesthetics of it, the Italian aesthetics especially of it, by his cousin and others to sucker him into uh, their group initially. But when it comes down to it, he's out. It's not politics. It's not religion, really. Sixteen years have any Sicilian relevance? I, again, I don't know. Twenty-three with them? I don't know. Jennifer quite rightly asks, any more thoughts, questions, and whatnot, which we didn't even get to tonight. I ask as well. Last chance. Careening towards the season of Santa, you know. Okay. Thanks, Michael and Jennifer. I'm out of time. Thank you. You're welcome. Beer has reason to be.